Well, good day, everybody. Welcome back to the channel. Well, what do you think? The background is getting a little bit better. These are my new shelves, and we've been going through a lot of my clutter and trying to make it all more reasonable. I have a lot of things I'm getting rid of, things I'm keeping, but my wife has been a real help in helping my office get more organized. Thank you to her. Today, we have a 1960 Royal FP. So last Sunday, we had our first meeting of the Albuquerque Typewriter Society in about a year and a half. And we met at the house of Kevin and Andrea Kittle. Had a great time. One of the members of our society has this Royal FP, and she was complaining that the type bars are sticking and it's real sluggish. She asked me if I would take it home and look at it, and I certainly wanted to because this is a beautiful machine. And it reminded me that, you know, this is along the same lineage of the Royal KMM that I have, and also uh, the more recent acquisition of my Aunt Pat's Royal 10, an heirloom typewriter from the early 1930s, I think, her 1933. So I have, you know, three machines that are essentially these full-size standard Royals. In terms of a comparison, I think it's going to be interesting. Let's look at the features and style and design of the FP and compare it to my KMM and see how do they compare? What did Royal do differently? What did they upgrade? What did they change? Stay tuned. So the FP line of standard Royal typewriters started around 1957, and if you go through the serial number database that uh, Ted Monk maintains on his webpage, uh, this particular machine ends up being manufactured in 1960. What's interesting is there are subsequent Royal standard typewriters that were introduced after the FP that appear to also be manufactured in the same era. So. I think what they're doing is the serial numbers they're using for these various models, they're using the serial numbers from the same serial number list. In other words, you might have one serial number different from this machine could be a different model from the FP, for instance. Uh, so that's an interesting observation I made in the serial number database. So FPP is the three letters that this serial number starts with. The third letter, the P, means it's PICA. If it was an FPE serial number, it would be, of course, Elite, right? The mechanism inside this machine is very similar to the older Royals. I happen to own a KMM. And I also inherited my Aunt Pat's Royal 10. And all of those machines share pretty much the same legacy of the kind of mechanism inside the machine with a few upgrades and changes over the years. For instance, this uh, FP has the magic margins just like the KMM. The magic margin, in fact, was introduced on the KMM. But the body style is quite a bit different. And I really love the body style, the paint job on this machine. My wife thinks this is a great looking typewriter. So let's go through and kind of compare the KMM and this FP. Well, when you set the two typewriters next to each other, KMM, FP, uh, superficially they look pretty much the same size. Obviously, the biggest difference here is the color of the machines. The keycaps on both machines are definitely different. The older KMM is the round style keys. The FP has the newer molded plastic keys. The keyboards are essentially the same width, though, in terms of the width between the keycaps. But the bodies are definitely different, the FP being a wider machine than the KMM. The FP measures at the back of the keyboard, it measures about 30 and a half centimeters, whereas the KMM measures about 27 centimeters, so about three centimeters or so, three and a half centimeters wider for the FP. The heights of the ribbon covers, though, are about the same, and the heights of the keyboards above the table surface are about the same. The basic controls on both machines, however, are the same. Backspace on the upper left corner, tabulator in the upper right corner, and margin release uh, above the right shift uh, key. Space bars, uh, the space bar on the KMM is a little bit wider than on the FP, but the FP is, is a little more kind of molded and sculpted right near the front of the bezel. One of the big differences is the location of the bichrome setting. So on the KMM, the bichrome is on the front here, and you have this locking lever preventing you from going into the 
stencil position by accident you have to purposefully push this lever to the left. Where on the FP the bichrome setting is a rotary knob here on the right side of the ribbon cover on the right side of the body. It's a lot cleaner of an appearance of the FP. And then the other thing you might notice is these ribbon controls on the KMM are visible in the upper left front panel, whereas on the KMM they're hidden underneath the ribbon cover. The ribbon cover on the KMM you have to pull it up by hand, whereas on the FP you push in the red royal logo to open up the ribbon cover. Well the stature of both machines here set up side by side with the front edge of the frame near the space bar even with each other. The feet are the same height but what's interesting is the FP on the right, the carriage ends up being slightly lower by maybe a centimeter or so than the KMM on the left. The touch control on the KMM was this knob on the right side panel here, whereas the touch control on the FP is now this six position detented lever underneath the right ribbon spool frame. The bodies of the two machines are also differ in the depth of the machine from front to back, the KMM being shorter and the FP also being longer. Interestingly though, they both maintain this design element that goes all the way back to the at least the Royal Model 10, which is this side panel. In this KMM it has the indicator for the touch setting on the FP there is no indicator but the side panels do pop off and it's an interesting little design element. I'm not really sure if it's particularly functional as far as gaining access for maintenance but it is a commonality to a lot of these standard Royal typewriters. From the operator's perspective however there are some refinements between the two machines so you can see the carriage return lever on the KMM it's fairly thin in terms of its construction and it has just this simple hook right here which is very functional. You can actually you know, kind of karate chop it to do a quick carriage return. It comes out right about to the corner of the left front corner of the ribbon cover. Whereas on the FP the construction of the carriage return lever is beefier and bulkier. There's more metal to it. It's a little bit longer and especially the end here, the handle or this paddle is much more ergonomic. It sticks out further uh, almost to the back row of keys and it's just so much more pleasant to use. There's nothing wrong with the KMMs but when you stand side by side in front of both of these and use them you realize this is so much more ergonomic. It is a nice refinement. And again, comparing user controls, the carriage knobs are very similar. Of course, there's a difference in color. The FP has the knurling on the edge of the rim of the knob, only in the outer part or the inner part is smooth, and it also kind of tapers a slight conical shape. The button is pretty much the same, however, for the clutch. Whereas with the KMM, the knurling goes across the full rim of the width of the knob, and it's not conical, it's more kind of slightly uh, rounded on the rim. The button is very similar, however. The line spacing selector on the KMM is more like an older style Royal where there's no real markings easily identifiable to tell you what the line spacing options are. It's this lever here that you have to pull, kind of like a shift lever on a car. And then the left hand carriage release button or lever you have to push down on it. So the ergonomics of it is more like you kind of grasp the, the left knob and you have to kind of push it down with your thumb. So you're kind of doing a grip like this. Compared to the FP where the line spacing selector is very easily uh, labeled one, two, and three. And the left hand carriage release button is more conveniently uh, operated with the index finger like that rather than the top of the carriage with the thumb. I like the way the carriage release levers can be operated either by pulling them towards you or pushing down on them from on top. That's an interesting little design feature that is very ergonomic. The line spacing release lever and the magic margin lever are essentially the same on both machines. One of the things I really like about the FP is this wonderful kind of brushed aluminum looking end cap 
to the carriage. It's a really nice style that matches this light gray finish. The FP has these nice ergonomic fingers uh, on either corner of the paper bale that makes it very convenient for flipping up the paper bale and pushing it back down. Or as on my KMM, the right hand corner of the paper bale has one of those fingers. But on my particular machine, the left hand one doesn't. And maybe that was a change made through the production run of these various models, or maybe my particular machine had this left hand uh, bracket maybe replaced at one time. Who knows? The paper bale and the paper bale rollers are almost identical on both machines. So the paper table behind it is a little different. Um, the shape of this paper guide is a little bit different. It's on the uh, KMM here, it kind of wraps around the top of this paper table. And also the paper table flips forward like this on the KMM. Whereas on the FP, the paper guide is a little shorter. It has a similar kind of scale. And then the paper table kind of hinges open like that from the back to reveal uh, the tabulator bar underneath it. The two machines are virtually identical in regards to the lower scale below the platen and also the uh, ribbon vibrator area and these two card guides and the little levers that are used to raise and lower them. They function essentially identical to each other. There are a set of little cover dust covers like this on both ribbon covers. Um, the KMM though, the clearance in here for the Type R's come is a lot tighter. As you can see here on the FP, these little dust cover plates are a lot wider apart than they are on the KMM. It just gives you more room in there to uh, change the ribbon. It's not quite so crowded. Underneath the ribbon cover, on the left side you have these controls for the ribbon. You have a manual directional reversing lever. So in this position they turn this way and in this position they turn the other way. And then this lever here you push back and hold it and you can manually wind on the ribbon in either direction for for instance rewinding the ribbon when you want to replace it. Serial number is located right here to the left of the left ribbon spool. An additional feature that the FP adds over the KMM is this end of paper, end of page indicator system that works similar to the competitor from Smith Corona at the time. The Magic Margin operates very similarly to the older KMM's version. So I want to set my print position like about here. I just pull the Magic Margin lever to set it. Typewriter keyboards came in a lot of different variations, and this is no different. This particular typewriter happens to be what I think is a Spanish keyboard. It has a tilde and a, like a caret symbol here, and then there are accent keys, uh, upper lower case, that are not a dead key. You actually have to backspace to put the accent key over a letter. And this accent key is in place of what would normally be the fraction, one quarter, one half fraction key. Other than that, everything else in this keyboard looks like a standard American keyboard. As I indicated earlier, this typewriter was pretty dirty and the owner wanted it cleaned and degreased. The, the type bars were hanging up in this segment. So I took it home. A lot of cat hair in the linkages, just everywhere you would imagine cat hair goes. I'm not really so sure if the cat hair was actually the root cause though. It just had a lot of residue of old lubricants or whatever that were very much gummy and my normal degreasing methods of using isopropyl alcohol and then blowing it out with compressed air. I needed to go one step further so I went to using lacquer thinner and working the uh, segment uh, really thoroughly and then blowing out the residue. I had to do that several times. Even then some of the type linkages were still sticky and it took a lot of individual work getting some of those uh, linkages degreased before it responded well. I even took a spray bottle of kind of degreaser stuff that I get at the Dollar General store and I even sprayed some of that in the segment and worked it really good and then wiped it out. I flushed it with alcohol and then I used a hot heat gun to dry it out real quickly and that seemed to actually help pretty good. So since I've been testing it the last day or so it hasn't had any problems anymore. So as an analogy, let's say you bought a 50-year-old car 
right? Actually, this typewriter was made in 1960, so this is more like, uh, what is it, 40, 50, 60 year old car. If you bought a 60 year old car and expected just to drive it off the lot and expect it to work, that would be very unrealistic expectation, obviously. So when you buy an old typewriter, you just have to figure it's part of the deal. It's not going to work properly until you adequately degrease the mechanism and clean it properly at the very minimum, assuming everything else is good. This typewriter, uh, though, also has a really hard platen. In fact, occasionally the type R's will bounce and make a double strike. So I'm going to advise the owner that she should at least use a backing sheet until she decides she'd like the platen recovered. It's a really beautiful typewriter, works really well, and this is one of these machines that if you're in the market for a standard upright mid-century marvel, something like this is really wonderful. And it really, the color, the royal light, uh, light gray finish, uh, the, sh the smooth finish, really is growing on me. I, I think it's really beautiful, especially combined with these silvery aluminum end caps on the carriage. It's just a beautiful machine. The typeface is pretty uh, nice on this machine. I like the style of it. Um, there is, however, a very hard platen on here, and occasionally the type R's will bounce off the hard platen and make a double strike. But uh, this is a good sampling of the typeface. It has a very attractive modern look to it. I seem to have disappeared almost behind these two behemoths. But as far as functionality, uh, these two particular samples differ because mainly this uh, typewriter was reconditioned serviced by John Lewis. This typewriter has not been. It's functional, but it's not quite as good of a typer. Um, this has a really dark ribbon, almost too dark actually for the Elite font, where this ribbon is not quite as dark as it should be. And then I gotta say, I really like this carriage return lever on the FP. It's a beautiful machine, and if you happen to like older style typewriters, like the antique look, the textured black finish, the round keys with the uh, nickel finished rims, and the legends under glass or plastic uh, key tops, this style is for you. This is a more modern look, and since I've been using it for the last day or two, I find it's kind of growing on me. I really like the looks of it, the modern look. Back in the day, like back in the 20s or whenever, one of the advertising gimmicks was the black textured finish was purposefully designed so the typewriter wasn't a distraction. It wasn't reflecting light. It was enabling the typist to concentrate on the work on the piece of paper right here. So they got away from that here in the late 1950s, early 60s, and now they're going more toward a more modern mid-20th century look to it. These machines haven't changed all that much in the intervening years since the Royal Tens were released way back when in the early part of the 20th century. You can't go wrong with either one of them, and really the bigger differences between one or the other happens to be related to the condition of the individual machine, and that's why it really helps to have one that's been properly serviced like this one has. And if you have an opportunity to get one of these, I'd recommend definitely get one. Everybody should have at least one of these standard typewriters in their collection, I believe. Well, what do you guys think? Do you think Royal made a mistake, or did they do something good when they went from this body style to this body style? I'd love to hear your comments about it. Leave a comment down below. Let's have a discussion about it. And until next time, stay creative and have yourselves a great day. Bye-bye for now.